Good afternoon. Good afternoon. As noted on the uh, program, I'm a member of the uh, IUPUI Senior Academy. Uh, as a retired staff member and member of the Senior Academy, it is my privilege to welcome you to this year's last lecture presentation. The Senior Academy is an organization of retired staff and faculty, members who are actively involved in supporting the university's <laughs> missions of healthcare, research, and education. <laughs> of course, the phrase, the last lecture, has many or several connotations. <laughs> <laughs> For example, when I was in school, back in the days, um, the last lecture phrase either meant spring break or summer vacation was just around the corner. Um, and I saw some of you smile when I said back in the days. You know, by definition, back in the days means 50 years or further. And as some of you know or may not know, uh, time travels at supersonic speeds. And as our life goes forward, it jumps to hypersonic speeds. So soon, some of you will be qualified to say back in the days. If there is one piece of wisdom I can add to this pending last lecture, is what a great man once said to me, my grandpa, he said, do today so you're proud of it tomorrow. Do today so that you're proud of it tomorrow. And today's last lecture exemplifies those words by offering us the opportunity to hear reflections on life's lessons and meaning from a retired IUPUI colleague of exceptional merit. So as co-sponsor with the IUPUI administration, and the IU Foundation, I welcome you to this year's last lecture presentation. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our chancellor, and he's given me absolution not to give a big flowery introduction. So, Chancellor Vance, please. Just the right introduction for me because this is not about the chancellor, this is about an amazing lecture opportunity. I want to welcome you to it, but I also want to celebrate the concept and encourage you to think uh, about who to encourage to be suggested for this, to think about what you would write as your last lecture, and encourage you actually to do that and then rewrite it again and again across your career. Because this was one of those ideas that someone came to my office and told me about with great passion and conviction that this was needed on the campus. And I let Jim East go through this whole presentation about it and the argument for it. And uh, he did so for those of you who knew him with his usual commitment and passion and uh, belief in lifelong learning and said, what a great idea. And also paused a second and decided I would tell him I'd heard of this before because I was at a university that, that did this, but it wasn't focused and run by the Senior Academy, which I thought was one of the really clever parts of this. Because one of the things about a university that makes us a wonderful place to be is we have literally thousands of people with great ideas. And some of them we actually let leave by calling them graduates. And some occasionally we let sneak out and call them retirees. And some we even allow to leave, to go to another institution because we don't believe in indentured servitude. <laughs> but one of the things that struck me about the last lecture idea is it is such a great 
rhetorical situation. It's a wonderful opportunity to conceive of what you want to share with your best colleagues, with your best students at this moment in your life. And that's why I agreed so readily to this. And I am so pleased that the lectures that we've heard have reinforced that this was a good idea and it's been done well. And when I saw who we were going to have this year, I just smiled because those of you in this room, many of you know owner Yurtsevin. So it won't surprise you to say that he might surprise us <laughs> because he has, for example, an astonishing sense of humor, dry, dry as the Arizona desert. <laughs> and as a result, we could get that or we could get the engineer with the plan for the future, always gently laid out, but clearly laid out. Or we could get the wit that we see in numerous circumstances. But it, we will leave here, I suspect, with both ideas buzzing in our heads and a smile on our lips. And that is one of the legacies I want from each of these lectures. So thank you for being here today. Thank you for supporting this return visit to our campus by owner Yurtsevin. And please draft that last lecture as soon as you get a chance. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. <laughs> I am delighted and honored to introduce my friend, owner Yurtsevin. He hired me 28 years ago. We worked together for 20 years. I reported to him on a daily basis, which is 41,700 hours. <laughs> We went to meetings together. We went to other campuses together. We went overseas together. We did a lot of things. We even went to workshops together. I remember uh, uh, Myers-Briggs. Uh, <laughs> you know where I'm going with this. Myers-Briggs uh, uh, test we took, and we were told that we are kind of uh, extrovert, I, we said, what, what do you mean by kind? I said, well, you are engineer. I said, what do you mean by engineer extrovert? They said, introvert engineer is one that when you talk to her, she looks at her shoes. When you talk to an extrovert engineer, she looks at your shoes. <laughs> so we've done a lot of things together in form of, uh, as, as two engineers would. Uh, he has been my mentor, he has been my role model, he has been one uh, that I have always followed, and he is my great friend. Uh, for those, a few of you that may not know uh, owner Yurtsevan, let me uh, describe what he's done and who he is. Dr. Yurtsevan is Dean Emeritus and Professor Emeritus of Electrical and Computer Engineering in the Purdue School of Engineering and Technology here at IUPUI. He earned a PhD in electrical engineering from Johns Hopkins University, Baltimore, Maryland, and a bachelor's degree in the same field from Middle East Technical University in Ankara, Turkey. Dr. Yurtsevan came to IUPI in 1977 as a visiting professor in the School of Engineering and Technology and continued with us uh, for over 33 years, concluding his career at IUPI as dean with many significant appointments along the way. Dr. Yurtsevan has extensively published articles on engineering education, signal processing, control systems, and robotics. He was a consultant uh, for NATO, United Nations Development Programs in Turkey, and for Union Carbide Corporations. As Dean, Yurtsevan was the driving force in establishing many new baccalaureate degrees, including biomedical engineering, biomedical engineering technology, computer engineering, computer graphics, and the list goes on, a number of graduate degree programs in engineering and technology. 
As IUPUI's new strategic plan develops, we know that a key goal for this campus is to strengthen internationalization efforts. We can look to owner Yurtsevin's example for inspiration. Under his leadership, the School of Engineering Technology grew both in size and stature and transformed to become an international center for learning, diversity, and exchange of ideas. He tirelessly promoted global connections and formal agreements with international partners grew as well under his leadership, including Canada, China, France, Germany, Turkey, Thailand, just to name a few. Dr. Yurtsevin served as provost for the IUPUI Malaysia program from 1994 to 1996 and led the establishment of a brand new private university to meet the needs of engineers in that nation. In 2007, he was recognized with the first honorary degree awarded by that university, an honorary degree in engineering, uh, University Tenaga Nacional in Malaysia. Indeed, the School of Engineering and Technologies Yurtsevan International Initiatives Fund has established a permanent legacy through an endowed fund to provide resources to expand international exchanges and underwrite scholarships and service learning programs. Owner Yurtsevan's legacy to IUP also comprises his many friends and associates, a number of whom are here today, including members of the IUPI Senior Academy. On behalf of his many friends at IUPI, I am pleased to present Dean Emeritus H. Owner Yurtsevin. Thank you very much. This is um, really overwhelming, and I'm uh, honored to be here uh, today among friends <coughs> and uh, colleagues. Uh, my morning started quite early. Uh, once, I suppose, you have, a, you, you have administrative position, especially uh, a position of a dean, you form <coughs> kind of uh, undesirable habits of checking whether people are working in the school. <laughs> so uh, I did my uh, <coughs> Friday morning routine as if I replaced uh, Dean Rusamano for the day and started with uh, my home department in SL building and then uh, went to uh, other departments. I should say that some departments were closed. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, worked my way to ET building and went again department by department and ended up in uh, Dean's office. I prepared a list who was there and who was not. <laughs> so Dean uh, Rusomano has that. <laughs> so if there is any kind of change in your salary for next year, uh, you may either thank me or uh, I don't want to say what you may do otherwise. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, Charles and Nasser. Thank you for your uh, very kind introduction. Uh, with this type of introduction, I think I'm already ahead. And the smartest thing for me to do is uh, quit right now. <laughs> because as you will see, the program uh, will go downhill from at this point. You may want to consider a more exciting and better Friday afternoon activity around IUPUI or downtown India. I want to thank the IUPUI Senior Academy for selecting me to deliver the uh, 2013 last lecture. I am truly uh, honored to be among the distinguished former last lecture presenters like <clears throat> James Lemons, Jan Ships, Bob, uh, Bob Eintours, and Angela McBride. After their names, 
I naturally feel out of place. When I received the uh, news and the invitation from Dr. Golan Manan of the Senior Academy, I shared it with my wife and my son. I want to bring my wife Madeline's greetings and also apologies for not being here today because of her previous family-related commitments. I explained to my son that this was another evidence of IUPUI recognizing <clears throat> my undeniable accomplishments <laughs> and unambiguous wisdom. My son nodded his head without lifting his gaze from his iPhone and iPad that he was monitoring concurrently and asked, if this is the last lecture, what will happen after the lecture? <laughs> I was quite angry and I sternly reminded him that his mother and I are in the process of changing our will <laughs> and that we would leave all we own to our two-year-old dog, Pamuk. <laughs> Young people seem to have forgotten the meaning of respect for the elderly. <laughs> it is great to be back home. After spending most of my academic career at IUPUI, I have sort of unexplainable attachment to this institution that I lovingly call underdog in disguise. Every time I get anxious and nervous about the future of IUPUI based on some news that I rehear or read from Indiana, I'm on a lot of listservs from campus, IUPUI shakes up, looks around, and then continues on its path doing remarkable things in spite of its unusual structure, awkward family tree, and difficult relatives. <laughs> Therefore, IUPUI is not an underdog, and it always knows its destiny to be a great university on the move. The theme of my talk is internationalization. It fortunately coincides with the theme of IUPUI task force identifying the international vision and mission, mission of the university. I have submitted my proposal to um, uh, Senior Academy in 2011 for 2012 last lecture. And I'm very pleased that my presentation today may resonate with some of the continuing excellent work that IEPY faculty, staff, and administration is doing as one of the ACE international laboratories of US higher education. As a, hard, as a hardwired and inflexible engineer, I prepare few PowerPoint slides, few hundred. <laughs> <coughs> Uh, it would have been my choice uh, to let the slides speak for themselves so that I do not have to say anything. <laughs> but during my academic training here at IAPUI, I discovered that killing the audience softly by PowerPoint is more effective if some sort of speech goes with it. <laughs> I chose my title of presentation to reflect my own journey, uh, and thus this is not a scholarly presentation on uh, internationalization or review of uh, this topic uh, among the uh, U.S. universities or how to study uh, uh, how to internationalize IUPUI. So it is really a personal journey towards global citizenship and how IEPY really helped me and facilitated me to get to this point. Long before the um, globalization became an expectation from a person or group of people or any educational business or community organization, I had no conscious plan or direction to take this journey. It just happened and I was swept in its powerful pull and flow. 
As I examined my career choices and decisions later in life, I attempted to figure out how it all started. This is normally not the way engineers and technologists work. They usually need to know the starting point and an ending point before they can tell you how to go from start to end in some optimal way. I discovered that my start was a wandering migrant, and the end is not inside yet. Here is the vague definition, I think, maybe. Uh, vague definition of wandering migrant. Uh, someone that moves from region to region by chance, instinct, or a plan. And these are some of the uh, characteristics of wandering migrants. And I, again, picked this up from my own experiences. And um, uh, lived in more than one country, learned uh, more than one language. Culture shock, of course, always came with it. I had to work hard and prove myself in every step because I was in a new community and I wasn't sure whether this community would accept me and my values. So I had to double up my efforts. And I had to be very flexible, quick thinker, and take some risks. Although I'm looking at some of the risks my son takes, uh, I was really pale compared to what he does. And I always have eternal optimism, and I still maintain that. Um, using these characteristics, I thought maybe a group of things, group of uh, people uh, would be labeled as wandering migrants. Of course, the workers in uh, both developed countries and developing countries, and uh, refugees, and artists, writers, and entrepreneurs. And I'll go some of that. In my mind, uh, seasonal workers going to foreign lands to earn a living for themselves and their families are not any different from students going to foreign lands to receive new education and a new profession to improve their future. Perhaps the same is true for refugees who chase after more peaceful and predictable lives. The artists, the writers, the entrepreneurs are in many ways perpetual migrants, as they are restless soul to begin with. And I think we have very good examples of that among the audience here that I know personally. Those are the people who can never retire and who will never retire. And um, so these are, I label them migrants because they move <coughs> from one challenge to another. Uh, perhaps some of the uh, internet uh, users, heavy users, uh, may be labeled as migrants as they wander in the uh, virtual world, although the word addict is probably a bit harsh description. Um, perhaps most wandering migrants reach certain milestones such as good jobs, happy unions, freedom of expression, and even disappointing U-turns during their anguished journeys. In my opinion, the destination to reach is to become a global citizen, and the journey is never over. If one thinks perhaps in mystic and religious terms, as in the case of Sufism, um, this journey is really to become with God. In evolutionary terms, it is a slow journey to perfection. Each uh, step is better than the previous step. The path we travel raises our consciousness and makes us aware that we are part of the same universe and same world. My brief uh, digression took me to choppy and dangerous waters of philosophy and religion, where no engineer as a hope of surviving. <laughs> Thus, I went to uh, get back to the definition of a global citizen, which is as vague as the definition of a wandering migrant. But I'll try it anyway. Uh, 
Uh, the global citizen thinks, feels, and cares beyond geographical and other boundaries, shares the joys and sorrows, and after change, which is good for everyone. And um, the core is really not um, uh, to feel empathy only for the people who live um, in other corners of the world, but it is to understand their lives and how they can be part of the, uh, the universe that we live in. Here are some characteristics uh, of a global citizen. Uh, people's definition change. For example, uh, is it the travel that makes global citizenship? Is it speaking many languages? Is it living and working in more than uh, one or two countries? Or is it knowing different cultures, reading about them, writing about them, uh, a global citizenship? A uh, list of potential candidates is even longer. <laughs> uh, the first one, uh, I have to tell that I picked up name before Pope Francis did. Uh, the second one, uh, some of you may not know, but he is well known in um, <clears throat> Turkey and Ottoman culture. He traveled the whole empire for 40 years, which expands from Turkey, parts of Europe, North Africa, Middle East, and all the way to uh, borders of Iran, and he wrote extensively. Marco Polo, of course, he was a businessman as a merchant. He traveled from Europe to China. Genghis Khan, uh, he doesn't have a good positive role model, <laughs> but he conquered uh, all of Asia and uh, parts of Europe. Our uh, Secretary of State uh, uh, traveled 112 countries and uh, put a million airline miles in four years. And I don't think John Kerry will even attempt uh, to uh, break uh, her record. Uh, Bill and Melinda Gates, uh, they uh, used their foundation dollars to heal millions in many countries. They traveled. And uh, so that is um, empathy, and that goes with the help, with the dollars, and the support. <laughs> Multinational companies, are they global citizens? Because they have offices uh, and plants in the US, in Mexico, in China, in other uh, countries of the world. Google is definitely a global citizen because he seems to know, or she seems to know, everyone in the world <clears throat> with their driverless uh, automobiles and <clears throat> with their um, uh, sort of ignoring privacy. They go around and uh, snoop. <laughs> <clears throat> everybody's windows, so they seem to accumulate enormous amount of knowledge, uh, so they can uh, be added uh, to that. Um, I added uh, the last item there, because now um, I am in my new country, the uh, Republic of the New York City, <laughs> run by the benevolent dictator Michael Bloomberg. I have been uh, to the uh, city-state of Singapore many times in the past, and I avoided <clears throat> getting arrested there as I was careful not to spit or chew gum in public. In New York City, you can do all these things and worse offenses, but you cannot get away with smoking, leaving the artifacts of your dog on a sidewalk, <laughs> or drinking large sugary drinks, almost. <laughs> I, however, fully support Mayor Bloomberg as a fellow electrical engineer, some of you probably may know, and a graduate of the same alma mater that I went to in Baltimore. So I excuse him all the time, and I'm, I say that I'm sure he has very good reasons to do all these things, and I admire his ability to agitate everyone in a different way. The reason I included the citizens of the New York City, David, will you pay attention, <laughs> is that they strongly believe that they are all model global citizens. And their obvious response to the question of, are you a global citizen? And they answer, how much more global 
can you get when you live in New York City, where everyone has some sort of accent. And when they open their mouth, uh, you can hear the accent. They are very liberal in selecting what they wear. And they have a hard time deciding which cuisine to honor for their lunch. I fit in quite well with my hard-to-guess accent, my Middle Eastern look, and accompanying small white dog in tow. <laughs> the intriguing detail is that my meeting or conversation with a New Yorker lasts more than a few minutes. They found out that I lived and worked in Indiana for more than 30 years. They ask why. <laughs> <clears throat> their, their interest melts away, and I'm treated like a distant rural cousin. I therefore concluded that the New Yorkers are global citizens if you define their globe as Manhattan <laughs> and few selected boroughs only. Even close by New Jersey or Connecticut are not interesting enough to waste any time on. Now, I would like to focus globalization uh, to a university setting only where I'm more comfortable and where one time I was protected by tenure. These days, I'm retired, so blissful retirement protects me from everything. <laughs> I see uh, citizenship as um, evolving at different levels. Personal at the program department level, school, college level, university level, and then with university's connection to alumni and their families, business and industry uh, on their advisory boards, and community at large, which works with the uh, uh, university. IEPY is an excellent example of this because it's so comprehensive. It has all these elements uh, in it. I started um, as um, uh, son of a second generation immigrants from Bosnia. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> family immigrated from Balkans uh, during the Balkan War and settled in the city of Kitahia when government gave them uh, three, four different choices. And uh, my grandfather chose it because Kitahia had the best water to drink. And that would not have been my selection criteria, <clears throat> but of course, uh, I can attest to his wisdom at that time now. And I learned uh, working knowledge of two cultures and two languages. I, of course, uh, grew up and I was born in Turkey, so I learned Turkish. But I had to learn uh, Bosnian as well. Uh, my grandparents did not speak uh, Turkish, and my Mother and father was in between two languages. And I was uh, very curious about what they are saying uh, and whether I'm missing anything. So I had to learn the uh, language. Uh, there were German engineers uh, working. They built a factory in this uh, city. Uh, and uh, my father was a, had a barber shop in the factory. And so he would... <coughs> uh, uh, German engineers would come there, and so I had an interaction with them. So that kind of fascinated me uh, uh, to, to interact. And of course, my father ended up learning and speaking more German than I did at that time. I received a very good high school education, and I'm finding out that good high school education is becoming uh, rarer and rarer in uh, many countries uh, that probably uh, includes parts of the U.S. as well. Uh, but I would not uh, stay in this hometown, and I had to uh, go to a university, even if my mother asked me to stay and live in that city for the rest of my life. I was fortunate to um, get scholarship for the uh, Middle East Technical University uh, in Ankara. And that university was new at that time, but it quickly became the university to go to. Um, 
The campus was outside of Ankara, US-style campus. Instruction was in English, so I had to spend a year, prep year, to learn English. But the teachers were uh, US and from UK and Turkish teachers. So uh, that may be the reason why I don't have any distinct accent, because I tried to imitate those teachers and never picked up uh, any of the three uh, in proper way. So um, um, then uh, uh, students were uh, <coughs> uh, a bit of international at that time, and it was unusual for a Turkish university, but they were mostly from Iran and Pakistan uh, nearby. And I did summer internships in a small German town uh, for uh, three months. And that was a great experience living with a German family. And I improved my German a bit more. Now, uh, my first meaningful international experience uh, was at U in the US when I came uh, <coughs> to um, Michigan State uh, at Lansing. Spent the summer there taking graduate uh, courses. I stayed in undergraduate dorm, and uh, I was in line every day on all you can eat and drink. At that time, I don't know whether they still do that. <clears throat> I was so amazed that US can be so rich uh, to let students eat all they want. Um, I would have also believed if someone had told me that the free beer was available flowing from the faucets in the dorm rooms. That was not the case, of course, but I would have bleed one. My first US political lesson also took place that summer when I watched the 1968 Democratic Party convention in Chicago on television. As my dorm roommates, uh, dorm mates, were screaming at the television screens that showed the footage of student protesters beaten by the police and taken away in police buses, I innocently said, what is the big deal? <laughs> These are everyday occurrences in Turkish universities. But the comment did not go over well. The anti-war movement of late 60s and early 70s gave me also the opportunity to watch closely one of the most interesting periods, I think, of US history. Equally striking and revealing for me was, this is in Baltimore uh, later, how to eat steamed crab and watch baseball. Um, it was clear expectation in Baltimore that these two things have to be done and learned if I were to survive in Baltimore and uh, has a chance to date a native. <laughs> I will digress again here and use sports as a cultural metaphor and perhaps some, in some ways measurable element of globalization. Baseball is uniquely a U.S. phenomenon that reflects the way people live their lives here. Everything is on a long term. Season is very long. There are endless number of games. And statistics do matter. And uh, they are more important than winning or losing a game on a given day. The philosophy is quite different for soccer which is a pastime of Europe and South America, where win or loss is important every day. Life is short, and one is not patient enough to wait for another soccer star to board, grow, and score a goal. For this reason, I have a hard time viewing some Europeans as global citizens when they shun and minimize baseball. And similarly, some US citizens seeing soccer only as an unrefined sport for disorderly hooligans. <laughs> this is, a, of course, questionable measurement. Um, at the three US universities that I stayed as a graduate student, I discovered that graduate engineering student communities were almost replicas of United Nations. I was fascinated with this, and I immediately understood why the US was, has been, and will be the destination of opportunities and possibilities for engineers, scientists, and technologists all over the world. The second thing I noticed was how these three universities provided the necessary infrastructure to welcome international students, create comfortable and nurturing environment for them, and prepare them 
to be the next generation of world engineers, scientists, and technologists. Even without saying that some of these people may stay or come back, they were preparing for that, actually. And um, this is, of course, great for migrant uh, students. In the uh, context of universal community, the second uh, one, uh, second level, is person's classroom, academic program, department, or peer group. Uh, there's a national, <coughs> natural and conscious interaction, and individuals may influence others in the unit, or uh, others may be affected by the members of uh, uh, <coughs> this unit towards global citizenship. The graduate engineering courses I had enrolled in the uh, uh, universities, uh, there was a mixture of U.S. students and a number of international students at that time, primarily from Asia and the Middle East. The internationalization, however, took place outside the classroom when my host family in Baltimore invited me to family gatherings during holidays and other celebrations during pitching dinners with international graduate students, competitive squash games with classmates, graduate student mixers and parties, as well as dating. So I think the International Programs Office and this university has been doing uh, most of these. And these are all tested and true practices. Uh, another advantage that I had is uh, after my Fulbright um, uh, scholarship, I was able to stay here for 18 months and work. And uh, I worked uh, for NASA, which gave me exposure uh, how the government side works, and also how the um, private sector computer sciences corporation within that NASA organization uh, works. After I finished my um, graduate work and worked here for 18 months, I went back to um, Middle East Technical University where I graduated <clears throat> because I had come uh, to get a graduate degree and go back as a faculty member. Uh, this was, at, uh, by that time, and after five years, this became a very elite university in Turkey, and with a very liberal and uh, leftist uh, agenda by the students. And uh, English was medium of instruction. And there were research funding opportunities, because it was exactly set the way U.S. universities would be set. And we were really excited about building a new institution. And the professors were American-educated. They were mostly Turkish professors. And they did not have the um, aura of classical Turkish university faculty members where you have to salute five times and stay uh, outside the door before they can tell you to come in. And um, uh, so the university environment uh, was quite uh, uh, different in the Middle East Technical University. Uh, <coughs> But after three years, uh, because of the um, political situation in Turkey, uh, student rights took place, university was closed, and the unstable political period started. And uh, so, to come back to the US uh, at that time. My wife, whom I met in Baltimore during my <coughs> graduate student years, also joined me uh, in Turkey. This time, I had a different exposure to internationalization in Ankara, as I was a local spouse of a U.S. citizen. At that time, I was not a U.S. citizen, or I did not have a green card. I was intermingling with other expats and their families. Most of female spouses quickly formed foreign wives' club in Ankara, organized themselves so well with the group readings, cultural tours of historical sites, and other many activities. Uh, it came to a point that I learned more about Turkey through them, through their cultural tours, because they were looking at uh, Turkey differently. When we returned to the US after three years, I att attempted to um, use the same concept and uh, start Foreign Husbands Club. <laughs> but I found no interest among foreign male spouses. And the, um, <clears throat> the Gloria Steinem 
MS magazine supporters like my wife found my idea ridiculous and in poor taste. Um, after uh, only uh, three years um, uh, in Ankara, we came to uh, uh, IUPUI in the fall of 1977 as a visiting faculty member to wait out political turmoil and confusion in Turkey. The difficulties were not resolved, and I decided to start a new academic career at IUPUI. Uh, this was a very different university. Uh, it was urban, although a Middle East Technical University could uh, be urban, although outside. Uh, uh, but the structure was different, and the uh, city was different, state was different. And uh, I'm a, a half Hoosier, and my son is Hoosier, he was born here. And in 1977, Indianapolis downtown was not the place to go, uh, perhaps after 6 p.m. And we had to uh, shuttle to Bloomington and West Lafayette to see foreign films or other films that do not uh, come to uh, regular cinema screens. Um, and uh, <clears throat> there was more teaching and hands-on teaching in the school at that time at IEPUI. Uh, uh, there was a... Uh, small research groups, but there was tenure to be achieved and for this grants to be brought in and papers to be published. The graduate programs in the School of Engineering and Technology were not in place yet. In a typical faculty survival mode, I reached out to my former colleagues in Turkey to extend my research projects from my former institution to IUPUI so that I could produce technical papers and proposals to submit to U.S. research funding agencies. I and few other colleagues attempted to bring in graduate students from Turkey so that we could form our own research teams. And one of my colleagues from that time, uh, Dr. Recker, has done that uh, magnificently. I was not very successful. I also noticed that there were a good number of international engineering and science faculty working together closely with outreach uh, to their own countries of origin. This is still a useful and successful model, I think, for international faculty members to do, but it's an incomplete one because the students and faculty should really mix with um, local domestic students um, that enhances uh, global citizenship in a faster way. Um, the next uh, level will be um, the, uh, at the school level or uh, college uh, level. And uh, at the college level, uh, it's probably possible to organize goals, activities, or strategies to make the unit more international by planning, resource allocation, and recruitment of diverse and global student faculty and administration. Uh, I made an early move to administration um, without establishing a uh, credible research record because uh, I found it a bit more interesting to be an uh, uh, <coughs> administrator. Uh, but then I also thought maybe I would have more, a better chance to access the um, uh, resources. Uh, rather than uh, uh, individual faculty uh, members. Um, and of course, that was the start of my uh, move in the dark abyss of administration, uh, looking for opportunities uh, for the school. There were a number of dedicated faculty and students, uh, faculty and staff uh, in the school at that time. They were willing to go to extra mile to accommodate international students, accommodate international faculty. The administration was also very supportive during my administration uh, years. And um, any initiative, however unorthodox, had a great support. Uh, former uh, executive vice chancellor Plater, uh, former executive vice chancellor uh, uh, Dr. Scott Mee, 
have supported these ideas along with uh, our chancellors, uh, BEPCO and BANTS. And I'm confident that <coughs> current executive vice chancellor uh, will continue honoring that tradition and giving <coughs> all wacky international ideas a chance. During my administrative watch here, I used to participate in the informal monthly <coughs> pizza and red wine dinners of the campus deans at downtown Basbo's Pizza in Indianapolis downtown. As the hardworking deans of IUPUI at that time, we knew that the well-known mathematical theorem applied to us. Here's the theorem. Group of deans is the only necessary and sufficient administrative team to run any university. <laughs> so pay attention to the words necessary and sufficient. <laughs> In our minds, usually after the second glass of wine, the upper administration layers here, and especially in Bloomington and West Lafayette, were all fluff. <laughs> Faculty, students, and the staff were often, were often difficult to govern and hard to please, as most of the time they did not know what they were talking about. <laughs> I'm sure all the current deans will appropriately deny this, and the only reason I can get away with saying this is because I'm retired. <laughs> I still, however, like the idea, and I subscribe to the irrational thinking like this during my retirement. Now my upper administration is the members of my apartment co-op board. <laughs> and the rest of the university world is 105 very difficult and independent-minded neighbors in the building. In the uh, School of Engineering and Technology, what started as a recruitment effort of international students from a few selected countries, <clears throat> the initiative grew and became reasonably good scale international activity. The school was also handed a major contract with the Malaysian utility company, Tanaga National and Government of Malaysia, by IU Bloomington, this is given to us, for us to partner and establish two plus two twinning engineering programs on site in Malaysia, and then transfer students to IUPUI after two years. Over 300 students, were in this program, and I spent two years as an IU liaison in Malaysia to start a program. Of course, believers of negative thinking, like Bobby Knight, <laughs> may assume that, and may say, even say, that this happened only because Bloomington did not have engineering programs, and that's why we had the contract. Shame on you, Bobby Knight. Interestingly, this experience gave me another internationalization experience where my wife, my son, and I were expats living in Malaysia, which became my third home away from home. Malaysia offered a great example of globalization in its attempt to integrate British and later American know-how education systems with the distinct cultures of Muslim, Chinese, Indian, and indigenous islander groups. My colleague, Tim Diemer, who was the uh, primary administrator for IU programs in Malaysia, used to call this international interaction in Malaysia the metaphysical traffic jam. <laughs> there was, of course, real traffic jam out on the streets, and I think they still do. Both Malaysia programs run by IU Bloomington and IU PUI succeeded well because they were not typical mainstream international program. I think the critical thing was the recruitment was towards the uh, family of the student and not the student only. And the expectation is that this interaction, this connection would be lifelong. So a student would come to IU, would come to IUPUI, and they would be treated well. They would get their education. And then when they go back, they would still be contacted as alum, alumni and they would be visited, and they would come and visit, and they would send their children 
to IUPUI or IU. And I think this has been happening in IU Bloomington campus for many years, as most of you uh, may know. And it has happened now in, uh, uh, in our school. The first group of students came here in 94, 95. I think we are having some of their children coming back to study engineering and technology. Because they were adult students at that time, they were working uh, for electric utility company. Another, attract, another challenging part of our partnership with Malaysia was that we were given the privilege of building a new university, as Nasser uh, pointed out. And uh, they used the model of IU and Purdue. And uh, at that time, during my stay in Malaysia, I understood that it was important to be a partner rather than a contractor. Uh, today, this university has over 5,000 students in Kuala Lumpur, outside of Kuala Lumpur, and mostly U.S. educated faculty. Some are graduates. And they still follow the engineering curricula that IUPUI put in place. It's a Purdue curricula. During my two-year stay in Malaysia, I had a chance to see how international universities, mostly from UK, Australia, Canada, and New Zealand, operated thereby opening branch campuses and using 2 plus 2 tuning programs to recruit Malaysian students. This appeared to be financially rewarding for foreign universities and their governments. Thus, they had invested heavily in Malaysia. The US education in engineering, business, and management at that time was very marketable. I think today that's also true in Malaysia uh, and other Asian countries. Uh, so, knowing this, I tried to carry the message to IUPUI and IU administration, maybe there should be a branch campus in that part of the world. And I so believed that I was so right, and everybody will be sorry that they didn't do it. Of course, uh, right after that 1997 financial crisis came to Southeast Asia, and all the foreigners who were there, they lost their pants. Uh, so, I'm glad the president of IU at that time, or IEPY chancellor, did not follow my advice. It is very difficult, I think, for a U.S. state university, even a private university from U.S., go there and make an investment there, because as, as a state university, our responsibility is to uh, state first. Uh, some of you may remember that MIT, for example, lost quite a bit of uh, money in Singapore after they built some infrastructure there. As a school, uh, we had to work uh, with uh, uh, limited resources uh, without very strong financial backup uh, from the campus or, or university. But in spite of that, we tried to uh, retain the academic integrity of uh, the connection and the twinning programs. I think we made sure that international students were receiving the correct Purdue diplomas and not the version that's produced uh, internationally. And uh, this required a lot of headache, of course, and a lot of checks and balances. And, uh, but we were uh, successful because we gave reasoning, uh, accreditation as a reasoning to do that. Uh, after our success with Malaysian students within the school, we developed a financial model for bringing more international students to campus. Nasser Paydar, who was the associate dean at the school at that time, came up with the idea. And uh, we looked at it, studied, and it became a successful recruitment. Uh, we extended our recruitment from Malaysia to Thailand, China, and the Middle East, helping the finances of the school uh, greatly. Um, and we had to build some of the internal support for international students within the school. Because at, at that time, IEPY did not have largely centralized support systems. Um, but today, the situation is quite different. Um, um, the most effective, I think, uh, internationalization is done at the campus level, in my opinion. And, um, uh, because that includes all units of the campus, and it involves faculty, student, uh, staff, 
and administrators. And um, these are some of the suggestions, and these are not, of course, revolutionary. Everybody knows uh, these. And I think IEPY has been, uh, has been doing uh, most of these things. But uh, the last item there, conflict resolution and peaceful coexistence. I think uh, when the countries are at odds, uh, politically, uh, for uh, various reasons, universities are the only vehicles to bring them together and to reopen the dialogue. <laughs> we have witnessed that um, with our partnership with the University of Tehran. In spite of all political odds, uh, there were two universities established ties with Iran at that time, University of Tehran. It was us, and it was University of uh, California, Davis. And uh, I think our program still, in some way, continues. It would have been a great <coughs> program with Iran, and uh, it would really help <coughs> Uh, the, uh, the continue the dialogue, at least at the um, uh, university uh, level. IEPY um, started uh, focusing on international strategies uh, a long time ago. And uh, uh, I think the successful initiative is now being topped with the uh, planning. Um, and the, uh, as we all know, the uh, efforts were recognized with the uh, uh, prestigious Haskell Award for building international strategic partnership with Moi uh, in Kenya, Sun Yat-sen in China, and the emerging partnership with the um, Autonomous University of the State of Hidalgo in Mexico. More recently, of course, IEPUI was one of the eight U.S. universities selected to participate in the American Council on Education Initiative, ACE International laboratory. The other side of international exchange is, of course, to send IEPY students, faculty, and staff to international locations for learning, teaching, research, and service purposes. And IEPY has, again, uh, has good examples of that, notably uh, School of Medicine, Liberal Arts, Law, has done, they were successful with that over the years. School of Engineering and Technology had challenges to overcome. Unfortunately, a number of engineering and technology students in the school, they are of the opinion that a major world power in technology, US, has nothing to learn from other countries. And so we had to continuously uh, teach our students that's not the case. And I think when they go and come back, they uh, think we are right. Um, <clears throat> but uh, uh, more efforts are underway to, to increase those uh, uh, numbers. Many of these campus level initiatives um, are done uh, at different universities. And uh, over the years, I used to look at, uh, go to university science. And fortunately, there is no patent right or copyright with these things that the universities do. So we have liberally copied what they have done. And I think other universities also maybe took uh, examples uh, from us. And it's a great learning process. There are a number of success stories um, in sort of international education. Uh, I think they are helping US uh, programs. Erasmus program is a great program in Europe. Uh, many uh, countries in Europe and outside of Europe has been using that because this is a free student exchange, and the European Union pays for it. And uh, uh, United Nations and UNESCO, uh, they have funds and grants uh, for that. And a number of US universities doing a great job in globalization area. Uh, some of the, except some of the name recognition, the old and tired ones, I will not uh, specifically mention their names, but when you go to a, a foreign country, uh, people are stuck with the ideas uh, that the U.S. News and World Report publish. And uh, if their children do not go to the first two or first three, then that's the end of the world for them, especially after uh, raising them and after giving them all these hopes. So if they cannot go to Harvard or Princeton or Yale, then the uh, sky is falling. Um, 
Family loyalty universities, I mentioned that earlier, and I think a university who pays attention to these student families uh, are uh, universities that are more successful in the globalization area. And uh, universities with uh, international focus and plan, like IUPUI, has been. And now I think the, there's even a great, greater extent of this uh, uh, planning uh, coming on. One of the examples, for example, we took is um, from the um, University of Rhode Island. And uh, they have been doing a very successful five-year program, uh, two dual-level program. In five years, engineering students get engineering uh, BS degree and BA degree in languages. And those are uh, start with German. They extend it to French, Spanish. And they have a huge number of students now in Chinese. Uh, so uh, the last time I looked at, the numbers were above 500 uh, students doing that. And some students choose that university because of this particular program. And so we uh, took all their plans and what they are doing and we uh, talked with the School of Liberal Arts and uh, we came up with a plan. Uh, so we have these programs in place in German, Spanish and um, French. But I believe uh, student numbers are not uh, high and the most successful one so far has been with Germany. Because it has, we have to find a partner and students have to go and spend summer in Germany uh, or another country to do internship. So there needs to be a uh, partner with the, um, <clears throat> uh, as a, as a uh, university as a partner, and also industry as a partner, either via that university or outside that uh, university. And I think uh, uh, a lot of companies around Indianapolis, through our industry advisory board, we found that they are very keen on international activities because that's part of their business plan. And so um, we have asked them to partner with us. And uh, Delphi has done, Rolls-Royce has done, uh, Cummins has done. Uh, we don't have uh, inroads to uh, uh, Eli Lilly, unfortunately, uh, but some of the other units on campus has, medicine has, of course, and science has. So uh, these are the ways really to, um, uh, to, to uh, become more international. Even smaller startup companies, uh, one that I'm involved, is looking for both university uh, <coughs> partnership and uh, business uh, partnership. Um, I will end... Um, um, uh, this with a question. Uh, this is very wide uh, brush. And uh, <clears throat> uh, IUPUI already offers wonderful degrees. And I did not know uh, that IU was and Purdue, they were so highly regarded uh, in Southeast Asia when I lived in Malaysia. It is really equivalent uh, to uh, Rolex watches that one has. It's an excellent brand name uh, in Southeast Asia. When I say, uh, uh, of course, IEPUI is hard to explain, uh, but when I start with IU, I say, oh, Indiana University. When I go to PU side, oh, Purdue University. Then it takes a while to get uh, to IEPUI part after uh, several cups of tea. Uh, <laughs> but since it is not IEPUI degree, they are fine with it. This IU degree, it's a Purdue degree. Um, uh, of course, IUPUI is a comprehensive university. Uh, the number 300 may not be correct, uh, uh, but that was my last check. Uh, I think it is very welcoming and nurturing, uh, both at the units uh, and at the um, uh, international programs, at the admissions and scholarship offices. And uh, uh, students coming here, whether international and domestic, they say they are treated better here than any other university that they have been to. Uh, there has been, of course, significant uh, progress over the years. And people like Indianapolis. And it is a big enough city uh, that <clears throat> they can do things. There's a sports team that they can support. And, um, but it's safe. And it is uh, industry hub, business hub. They can do internships right here. And they can probably get jobs. 
probably IUPUI could do more in the transportation, and I think uh, uh, I have been reading some of this again recently. Transportation is on the agenda of uh, new governor and uh, uh, mayor as well. Campus housing, uh, if you thought I was going to give you a solution, uh, you're uh, mistaken. Uh, <laughs> I will point out that there is a need, and uh, I will let uh, Chancellor Benz worry about it. Uh, <laughs> that's why I think he has more gray hair than he came with. I think the engagement with Hidalgo and Mexico is uh, still in the infancy, if I'm not mistaken. There's such a great potential there with the uh, Spanish language and uh, uh, <clears throat> closeness uh, instead of flying to uh, China or other places. 10, 12 hours, in a few hours uh, we can go. And uh, uh, expanding dual degree programs with foreign languages, I think is a great uh, idea. It is very difficult for engineering students. I don't know whether you dealt with them, engineering or technology students. Uh, they would not uh, learn another language uh, unless it is a reward. And the reward is to have another degree and do it in five years. That's a very good economical model for them. And there are very good examples of uh, uh, our partners in industry have been telling us, if you are a engin good engineer, but if you know Chinese, if you know Russian, if you know German, then you're, you're, you're OK. Uh, so uh, I'm very excited about the strategic uh, <clears throat> plan. And uh, I. Uh, 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 from Senior Academy, I volunteered to work on some of the subcommittees, and I'm um, uh, on their uh, list for uh, conference telephone connection. Yesterday, I went to my first live meeting in uh, ES building, face-to-face, -face, which is much better, uh, because you have to hug everyone first and then sit down and uh, uh, talk about international <laughs> programs, which is much civilized way of uh, doing that. Uh, and I uh, am interested to learn where IUPUI is going and what they will do in this area. I'm sure it will be a very successful uh, venture by 2025. The numbers are already increasing. I have checked the uh, international student numbers. A number of countries, uh, internship programs are on the increase. Uh, study abroad programs are very successful. So all the elements are there. Um, Uh, I don't know whether you saw this commercial on television. They end uh, saying, globally yours. <laughs> I, <clears throat> I don't think Turks know what they are talking about, but um, <laughs> uh, they may be onto something here with globalization and internationalization. Thank you very much for your patience, and I would be happy to uh, answer any questions if uh, there is any time left. Thank you again. <laughs>
The IU Foundation has been pleased to support the last lecture series for the past five years. The last lecture has provided each of our guest lecturers the opportunity to share their unique perspectives with us and, in so doing, has served to influence the larger community dialogue and affect important change. On behalf of the campus and the Indiana University Foundation, we are honored to support your presentation of the lecture today and to recognize this most prestigious occasion. Thank you. Thank and in your native language, to check it at Thank you. <laughs> Sir, we have one last act. If you would come over here, please. Uh, in appreciation for your presentation, the senior candidate would like to present you with this award. And many Thank thanks from the co-sponsors too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Before we retire to the uh, reception area and a chat with uh, Dr. Uh, Yersevin, uh, I have to recognize a few people. I th you all know that it takes a task force to get something like this up and running. Uh, so I want to introduce some people, have them stand, hold your applause till we're all done. From the Office of uh, Academic Affairs, <laughs> Sue Harrell, please stand. Uh, Lori Klosterman. Angie Vinci, and Susan Christian. Uh, Senior Academy Office, Lee McLaughlin, she's home with a bad cold. Uh, the School of Engineering, Lisa Jones, who was Dr. Yersevin's uh, Executive Secretary when he was on duty. Uh, from this campus center here, Brian Fetter. Uh, from the uh, IU Communications uh, Department, uh, Liz Kay. And from UITS, George Stevens, and Don Lorenz. I have one last person, and he is the man that has been the chair of the last lecture five years running. I'd like to introduce Dr. Golan Manan. Please stand. Job well done. This concludes the last lecture. We'll see you outside. Thank you very much.